presentation if y'all are ready. Um, if you guys have questions, y'all can either interrupt me or uh, you can send them to the chat box. I'll try and keep an eye on it here. If you've got questions during the presentation, for sure, just let me know. And then we'll open it up for questions at the end as well. Okay, so first I kind of want to do a pre quiz thing. So y'all type in the chat box what uh, what you think this thing is. Um, I would suggest in Texas, if you're going to study entomology, this was Beth asked in the chat box, I would suggest A&M. That's the only uh, school in Texas currently that's got an entomology degree. All right, Tara, that's right. That is a, that is a good bug. Y'all got this right. Praying mantis. Okay, what about number two? Is that one a good one or a bad one? All right, nope, that one's a good one. We'll get into that in a little bit. What about number three? Number two is a ladybug. And number three is bad, y'all are on board. Which one was a ladybug? Number two? No, number two is not a ladybug. <laughs> that, one's a, that one's a lace wing. Uh, number three is a, that's a leaf-footed bug, that's right. Okay, what about number four? Is this a good one or a bad one? Yep, that is a good one. An assassin bug. What about number five? Everybody's saying that one's a bad one. That's a good one. That one's a lady beetle. Okay, so now I'm going to go over the principles of IPM. Y'all can read that. Uh, the integrated pest management is an ecologically based strategy. Um, so what I do, I don't necessarily just recommend spraying something. Got to look at the whole system, see what works for you, like economically and for the individual situation. Um, uh, the management practices I recommend usually include multiple methods of control. It's not just chemical. So we have to look at the whole system and approach the best way possible. Um, the key strategies of pest control, uh, a lot of what I deal with, especially since I work in row crops, is looking at plants with genetic resistance to pests or disease. Uh, Biological control is an option, although that works better in closed systems uh, than it does in open field stuff for the most part, or in smaller systems in gardens. It can work very well too. Uh, environmental and cultural control is another thing that you can do. So that's just alternating your, your system, um, altering your system so you won't have an issue with the pest anymore. And then chemical control is also an option. And you all know what that one is. Uh, the first thing that I usually need to do, though, whenever I'm looking at approaching a pest problem is, what is it? So uh, I look at, I've gotten to where I'm pretty good at it, but one of the best ways that you can go through and figure out what, an in, what your pest is, is look at how many legs it's got, whether or not it has wings, check out the mouth parts, body shape, and what's it doing. That's a good way to get a lead on what you're dealing with and to figure out how you need to approach the problem, or if you even have one. So arachnids, this is going to be spiders, eight legs, combined head and thorax. So they don't have like an insect does, um, and they don't have any antenna. And these are all predatory for the most part. Uh, these are dip, diploda. That's going to be your millipedes. So these are mostly uh, herbivorous, or they can feed on decaying stuff. Uh, they've got two legs per body segment, and they're pretty long, as you can see there. That's millipedes. Uh, Chylopoda is going to be your centipedes, and you'll notice that this one's got one pair of legs instead of two per body segment. And those are normally predatory, and these will actually bite the fire out of you, so be careful, careful with centipedes. Uh, millipedes, not so much. Just don't eat them. A lot of them are poisonous. Not normally a problem for people, but, you know, if you've got pets. Uh, Sisonura, that's going to be silverfish. How many of y'all have seen silverfish in your house? I get them down here. So, yeah. They're pretty common. Uh, these groups that we're going on right now are actually not true insects. We'll get into those in a little bit. Uh, Columbola, so that's going to be your springtail. Uh, these guys thrive in moist environments, and most of them are decomposers. So you'll have them, if you've got a compost heap or something, I see them in there a lot. Occasionally, you'll get them in your sink. They'll come up through a drain or something. Uh, and then mayflies, ephemeroptera. So that means short-lived. 
a lot of times having a little bit of background on words helps. Uh, it'll kind of tell you a little bit on what the Greek roots and stuff, a little bit more about the insect. Ephemeroptera, that means short-lived wing. Mayflies, um, Mayflies are insects. The other two and the previous ones are not, technically. Uh, and mayflies actually are one of the more basal groups. So they're one of the only insects that sheds its skin after it gets wings. Everything else does not. Mayflies have a, uh, they've got a sub-imago stage whenever they emerge from the water and then they molt again with wings. Uh, columbulins lack an organ in the antenna, the little springtails do, so that they're not uh, insects, technically. Okay, any other questions on those? And these that we've gone over so far really don't have, uh, there's not any concern on those in a garden system. I'm sorry, which one did you say was like a composter? Uh, you'll see the columbulins, the springtails, those can be in compost. All right, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Odonata. So the name of this group means old tooth. Uh, this is dragonflies and uh, damselflies. Uh, dragonflies, their eyes touch at the top. Damselflies, their eyes do not. Uh, they've got six forward angled legs. So if you look at a dragonfly, they're very much built for eating while they're flying and pretty much spending all their time flying. Uh, they've got four wings, large eyes, very short antenna and chewing mouth parts, and they're exclusively predatory. So these guys are not a problem. Their, their larvae are really neat too, or nymphs, nymphs, sorry, they do not go through, they do not pupate. Uh, but dragonfly nymphs are very neat. They have specially adapted mouth parts for uh, grabbing and eating prey. It looks like an arm that comes out from underneath the, uh, the head there. It's really neat. If you can look up a video on YouTube on those later and see what a dragonfly feeding looks like as a nymph, it's pretty cool. But the form fits function on insects, so that's something to keep in mind whenever you're trying to ID it. If it looks like it can do something, if it looks like it serves a function, it probably does. That's a pretty good way to look at stuff. Um, Orthoptera, those are going to be the grasshoppers. This is straight wing is what their name means. Uh, and you can, you know, they've got pretty straight wings coming off the back. They've got four of them. Uh, the antenna are present. Katie did have longer antenna, grasshoppers have shorter. Uh, they've got jumping legs and chewing mouth parts. Uh, and these are definitely adapted to feed on plants, and you can kind of tell looking at them. There are species of katydids that are predatory, though. Okay, spasmids. That's going to be your walking sticks. They've got six legs. They're elongated body form. They may or may not have wings or wing pads, and they do, they do have chewing mouth parts. Um, in North America, so all of our uh, walking sticks are not going to be able to fly. Other places they can, but none of the ones that we have in North America fly. And these guys are going to be plant feeders. Dermaptera, so this is going to be your earwigs. They've got six legs, the pincers on the back. Uh, those are called cerci. And the antenna are present. Uh, they've got four wings. They're underneath some leather, leathery covers, so that's what the the name means is Dermaptera skin wing, uh, and they do have four of them present, and they have chewing mouth parts. And there is a mix on these. Some of them feed on plants, and some of them don't. Um, we do have some of them that are predatory. It's just, it depends on the species. Uh, praying mantises. They've got six legs as well. Uh, they do have wing, uh, four wings and four wing pads, depending on species. Uh, a lot of the females either are very clunky flyers or don't fly at all. Uh, the males can normally fly. Uh, they've got raptorial forelimbs. That means they use them for grasping and eating things. Uh, antennas are present and their mouth parts are chewing. These guys are predatory and they look like it. Termites. So Isoptera and Bladadea, these are termites and cockroaches are actually very closely related. Uh, termites have a wing form and their wings are equal size. That's what Isoptera means. Uh, and the funny thing, Bladadea actually is just the Greek word for cockroach. So I guess everybody's had an issue with them and wanted to have a word for them. And I think everybody knows what a cockroach is. We've got them pretty much everywhere down here. That was new to me, by the way. Growing up in West Texas, we do not have cockroaches very commonly. And moving down here was a little bit of a shock.
Themyptera, this is going to be the true bugs. So these are getting into some of the larger groups, and the rules don't necessarily apply real broadly to everything. Uh, we've got a mix of stuff that is plant feeding and uh, predatory. They've all got six legs, though. Uh, the wings are held either tent-like or in an X. So a cicada is one that would be tent-like. Uh, the antenna are present, and they have sucking mouth parts. And that's how you can tell it's in this group. So actually, the name actually means half wing, which you can kind of tell on the stink, stink bug here. It looks like it's got half of a wing showing there. Thrips. So this is actually what I've been doing my th thesis on. Uh, they also have six legs. They have antenna. They can have wings. Uh, they've got a fringe on them. That's what the name means, is fringe wing. And they have a sort of piercing sucking mouth part. They're, they've got a punch and suck mechanism. They've got asymmetrical mouth parts. The left hand side is like a hole punch and the other side is like a stylet. Uh, and they can suck the plant juice out. But they feed on one plant cell at a time. They puncture them as they go and then suck the juice out. So whenever they leave damage on a plant, it'll usually curl the leaves under a little bit. And if you look at it where there's a lot of damage, it'll kind of look silvery where they've fed. And I think that's got to do with the way that they're puncturing individual plant cells. These have been in the news recently too. I don't know if that y'all have noticed that uh, chili thrips were picked up in Texas feeding on a few things. I know in the valley they had a problem with them in cotton. And they've been a problem, I think, in citrus for a while. So they found them in a lot of vegetable crops. So if y'all got real bad thrips damage in, some, in like roses or something, you know, give your extension office a call because it might be chili thrips. Uh, Coleoptera is another group. This is one of the biggest groups. It's got, they've got six legs again, the antenna are present. Uh, Coleoptera means shell wing, which suits beetles pretty well. Uh, and they've got chewing mouth parts for sure. One set of their four wings, one set of their two pairs of wings is going to be the hard shell, and that's how you can kind of tell it's a beetle. There's some goofy ones that are a little hard to tell, like rove beetles, and they look a little bit more like an earwig, but they don't have the pinchers on the back. I'm glad you nailed them. Yeah, chili thrips are a, they're a nuisance. Saw that in the chat there from Beth. Uh, Neuroptera, this is a this is a real oddball group. This uh, nerve wing is what that means. Uh, this is a lace wing in the picture there, and they're highly uh, veinated there. They've got six legs, four wings, and chewing mouth parts, and they have piercing and sucking mouth parts as larvae. Another good one is ant lions, the little guys that make those little uh, kind of like little cone-shaped deals in the sand. I don't know if y'all have seen those. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody? No? Okay, well, in real sandy spots, like, especially in, um, like, barns that have, like, a dirt floor or something, got ant lines. They'll make a little cone in the deal, in the dirt, and ants will fall in there, and they grab them at the bottom, because ants can't climb up the sides. They're pretty cool. Uh, but the adults look similar to lace wings. They're larger, though, and they've got, uh, a little bit different, the antenna are different, and they're a longer insect. They're pretty cool. Okay, Hymenoptera. So this is going to be your wasps and bees. Uh, they've got six legs, four wings, the antenna, chewing or lapping mouth parts. You've seen honeybee mouth parts. They've got kind of like a tongue in there. So they've got a mix of most of the other uh, others in that group, I think, have chewing mouth parts, but honeybees have kind of a goofy tongue thing. Uh, Mycoptera, that's a group we're not really going to deal with a whole much. That's going to be scorpion flies and hanging flies. Um, most of those are predatory. Uh, they don't actually sting. Scorpion flies just look like they have a stinger. Uh, Trichoptera, that's going to be another aquatic species. Uh, they've got little fringes on, their, on the edge of their wings. They look, they're caddis flies. Uh, they make little, some people make jewelry out of their uh, larval stage. It's kind of neat. Uh, but they gather up rocks and stuff and spin silk in it and make a little bag thing out of it. So it's kind of like an underwater bag worm a little bit. Uh, so coptera, that's going to be your book lice and bark lice, uh, depending on which one of those you have. For the most part, uh, outdoors and in garden settings are pretty inconsequential. We don't really worry about them much. They, uh, they can be uh, unpleasant cosmetically, but they're not actually causing any damage to your plant. Uh, they will feed on lichen and stuff, but they eat things that are normally already decaying a little bit, so they're not actually causing damage to your plant. 
uh, Lepidoptera. So this is going to be the moths and butterflies. They have antennae as adults. The larvae normally don't. Some of them probably do. Uh, there's exceptions to everything. Uh, chewing mouth parts of the larva. For the most part, these guys are going to be predatory, but they're or predatory. I'm sorry. Or they normally are herbivorous, but there is a species that is predatory in Hawaii. It's an inchworm. That's another thing you want to look up on YouTube. That's a pretty cool video, especially since caterpillars don't really have eyes to speak of. They only have a, they can sense light. That's about it. They can't see much. They're pretty much just walking, eating machines. Uh, and the adults have, you know, the role that proboscis like a butterfly has. Uh, some of them don't even have that. This moth that I'm holding here, this is a, this is a polyphemus moth. This one doesn't have mouth parts at all, which is pretty common of the silk moths. A lot of the adults don't feed at all. Diptera, so this is going to be flies. Uh, I picked this one. This is a crane fly. So I want you all to look behind the wing on this thing. I don't know if y'all, I can't see my mouth on mine. Uh, but right behind the wing, there's a little deal sticking off. It looks like a little stick with a knob on the end of it. That thing, uh, serve, that's the halteers. Those serve as a gyroscope. So if you've ever seen a housefly flying around and they can just like fly up to the ceiling and flip upside down, that's, that's what they use to do that. So that organ there serves as a gyroscope and keeps them balanced so that they can do some of the acrobatics that they can do. Um, as larvae, they've got like rasping or sucking mouth parts. Uh, they've got like little scrapey bits on the inside of their mouth. It's kind of interesting to look at underneath a microscope. Um, as adults, say they're up piercing, sucking, or lapping. Uh, Y'all seen a housefly with the like sponge thing that's on the end there, uh, or like a mosquito it pierces, or a horsefly. Yeah. yeah, it's not a giant mosquito. This one's not. Uh, this is a crane fly, and those are a good thing. Uh, they're pretty good decomposers. They're just kind of a nuisance because their legs fall off everywhere. So I'm not that crazy about them, but they are neat insects. Okay, we're gonna go over the quiz here for everybody. Praying mantis, I think everybody got that one right. This is a lacewing larva. So we did look at the adult earlier on this guy. Uh, fun fact about these things, so they, whenever they bite, they've got a enzyme that they inject into whatever they bite and it starts dissolving whatever it is. Uh, and then they suck it out like a Slurpee. And there's some of them that they take the exoskeleton afterward and they stack it all over their back so they look like little walking piles of junk so other stuff doesn't eat them. They're, they're a really neat bug. And they actually don't desiccate while they're in the larval stage at all. So I thought that was kind of interesting. They have to wait until after they pupate. So lace wings are not case makers, but they do stack stuff on themselves. Okay, assassin bug. This guy, I get a lot of calls about people mistaking uh, leaf-footed bugs for these things because they do look pretty similar. Yeah, you know, like a decorator crab, that's cool. Uh, assassin bugs though, they've, this is an adult on the right. If it's got wings, it's an adult and can reproduce. If it does not, it probably is a nymph unless it's a species that doesn't have wings. Um, but these guys are predatory. You can kind of tell on true bugs like where they're where their beak attaches as far as whether or not they're going to be predatory. So this one, you can really tell in that, that bigger picture that his beak attaches like on the end of his nose there. So he can articulate it a little bit more. Uh, some of the plant feeders, it's attached farther down like in the middle of the chest. So they can't really artic articulate it as much and you, you can kind of tell that they're more likely to feed on plants. Ladybug larva. So this guy, I know it kind of, this is a tricky one. I put it on a leaf that's been chewed on because this this was a sorghum field that had every pest I've ever seen in it. It was a mess and you can see the leaves are real shiny. We had huge enormous numbers of aphids in that field and so there was honeydew all over everything and the whole field was sticky. It was gross. Uh, the lower leaves were like solid sooty mold which is another pretty good indicator of either aphids or mealybugs or something like that. Uh, but yeah he was going along and what cracks me up about this ladybug larva is he was he was walking along and checking aphids and like squeezing them and then going along and like picking which one he wanted to eat like somebody at the grocery store looking at a fruit. It cracks me up. But those are predatory. <laughs> Leaf-footed bugs. So that's the adult on the right there. 
Uh, these guys are kind of hard to control, but that's what the adult looks like. Uh, and then the nymph. So you'll notice that these guys look a lot like the assassin bug that we looked at earlier. They're the same coloration and everything. But these guys are all hanging out together. Uh, bugs are not super bright. Uh, their brains are very small. They're mostly responding to immediate stimulus. Uh, and they've got little uh, nerve ganglia that go all the way down the back of the insect. And they respond pretty much are just responding to stimulus. There are some other things going on, but they're not smart. So if it's hanging out in a group like that, you could pretty well guarantee it's not going to be something that's predatory. Because predatory things do not hang out in a group because they will eat each other. So if it's hanging out in a group, it's probably a plant feeder. That's a pretty good indicator right there. So that's one way that I knew for sure that these were going to be leaf-footed bug nymphs and not assassin bug nymphs. Because normally they will not hang out while they're that big. Because these are not freshly hatched. Uh, since they've got some color to them, they're, uh, they're, they've already molted a couple of times. And they'll hang out in a little group like that. Whereas assassin bugs, once they hatch, they'll pretty much scatter immediately. So they probably won't even have color to them before they scatter. OK, let's go over some beneficial insects here. Everybody know what these are? Spiders. spiders. Yeah. OK, so spiders all have different hunting techniques, too. So we're going to keep in mind the form fits function kind of a thing. Uh, this black and yellow garden spider here, they build a big web. How many of y'all have walked into them? I know I've, we were doing a field trial in corn one time, and I had goggles on and walked through. And they're always at eye level. I got him stuck to my goggles on my face, and it was a big one. So that was good. Uh, I did not scream. I did get him off. It did scare me, though. Uh, but the way those hunt, they make a big web, and they wait for something to fly through. But they like rows of corn or grapes. It's a little entryway for them. You know? They like an open space where stuff's going to fly through, and they're going to be able to catch it. So they're a sit-and-wait predator, and then they eat it when it runs into the web. Uh, the lynx spider we've got, that's the one on the bottom right. That guy is, it kind of stalks them, but he's got really long forelegs. So he's going to wait until something gets kind of close and he's going to grab it with those forelegs. And that's how he's going to hunt. The little jumping spiders, um, I don't know how many, have, have y'all seen these guys kind of running around? They're very mobile and they bounce around a lot. They're very active hunters. Uh, they'll chase a laser pointer too, so that's kind of fun. Um, but yeah, they're very active hunters. They're more like a cat. They're going to chase something down. And that's good to, good to keep in mind for how they act and like what kind of hunting style they're going to have. Uh, they're also very visually oriented. So uh, I think a peacock jumping spider is one of them. Y'all ought to Google that one too. That's a, that's a neat little bug. Uh, but the male's got little kind of feathers on the side of his abdomen. Uh, so to keep the female from eating him, and all, most jumping spiders do this, but the male, he's trying to get her attention without getting her to eat him. So like wave his arms at her. <laughs> like, hey, don't eat me. I'm, I'm a friend. I'm not dinner. But so that's, that's something to do with like a behavioral alteration uh, for something that's predatory so they can avoid getting eaten. Because uh, like I said, bugs are not super smart. So if it's smaller than her, she's probably going to try and eat it. And the males normally are. I didn't even realize that one was a male. That's kind of cool. Okay, go to the next slide here. Okay, lady beetles. Uh, these guys are predatory. Normally, the the eggs are going to be bright yellow. Uh, you can see a lot of aphids in that picture, so that one's not too worried about you know her her baby starving or anything there. Uh, that's a pink lady beetle. We've got several different species of lady beetles here. Uh, this is one of the native ones, and that's what the larva look like there. And then the the pupa right there is on the bottom right as well. Uh, but that's that particular species of lady beetle. I think that one might be one of my favorites. And there's, there's several, and the, the larvae all look a little bit different, but they all hold this same kind of alligator looking form, but without the front pinchers like the uh, lace wing larva has. And they've got a complete metamorphosis, so, you know, uh, they pupate and all. This is going to be uh, that top one there. That's that Asian, multicolored Asian lady beetle. Uh, they're still a lady beetle. They're still predatory. Uh, that's what they look like. Like, And then the smaller one there that's got white fuzzy stuff all over it, 
uh, that's one of the might destroyers. And they're a very small lady beetle, but they do a lot of damage. You can see the adult there next to a parasitized aphid. So you can tell they're pretty little. But they do a, a lot of good on in row crop, especially. I see them in heavily aphid infested stuff or in things that have uh, in corn that's got a mite infestation. These guys really bulldoze through those mites. Okay, damsel bug is the first one on the top left there. Uh, that's another sit and wait predator. It's got front it, front legs that can grab. It's kind of a type of assassin bug. It's just a little lighter limbed. Uh, the top right there, that's another assassin bug. Again, you know, grabby with the front legs there. Uh, and then the black and white guy there, he is a pirate bug. That's a minute pirate bug. And they are very active hunters as well. And I've seen them eat things much, much larger than them. Uh, if they can catch it, they're going to try and eat it. Uh, they're a very good insect to have in your garden. Uh, but then they've got, again, all of these have the man or the, the style is going to be on the front of the insect. They're going to be able to move it around and stab into whatever they're wanting to eat. The, the one in the bottom right there, that's an ambush bug. So that's a sit and wait predator. You can tell his outline is kind of hard to make out. Like he's got little branchy bits coming off of him. So that's to better disguise himself as you, if he's wanting to sit somewhere and not be seen. Uh, and he's definitely got the same kind of four limbs to grab onto stuff. It's kind of like a praying mantis does. He's got spines on the inside of his four legs as well. Okay, this is a lace wing. So that's what one of the lace wing eggs look like. It's uh, laid on a stalk. It's got a little stem coming up before uh, it, it's not laid directly on the leaf. It's got that stem. And they do that to avoid cannibalization because they will lay their eggs kind of kind of close together, not real close together normally. Uh, but I've, I've seen a whole bunch of them before. But they do that so the larva, once they hatch, won't climb up and eat the other eggs. They will. They're pretty voracious predators. I've been bitten by these. They're kind of unpleasant to get bitten by. Uh, hey, is that the top left? Top left, yeah, that's an egg. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And then the top right is the larva. The adult is on the bottom left. And then the pupa is on the bottom right. They make a little fuzzy deal that's stuck to the leaf. And they're usually close to the inside of the veins like that. It's, they're, they're a neat looking bug. Uh, don't smush the adults, they smell really bad. Um, I don't know if I mentioned that earlier, but they do stink. And they're a good predator, so you want to have them. Wasps. Uh, so how many of y'all think these are a good thing or a bad thing? Got to vote either way. They're actually good. They are. Yeah. So wasps are predatory. Uh, the adults definitely flower feed um, and then the larvae are very predatory depending on the species the adults are as well. Um, so the reddish looking one I've got there, that is an ichneumon wasp and they, that, that one's a male. But the females have really long ovipositors, and they'll go look for uh, wood boring insects and lay eggs in them. So they can actually feel the vibrations in the wood, and then they'll drill their, with their ovipositor into the uh, wood and lay an egg in the larva that's on the inside of the plant. It's pretty cool. Uh, there's a paper wasp there on the bottom right. Bottom left. Sorry, bottom left. That's a paper wasp. Uh, those guys are not picky on what they will eat. They will catch other insects and chew them up and feed them to their babies. Uh, and then the one on the bottom right there, that's one of the aphid parasitoids. These guys are very small. I think that one's a burconid, but there's a few different families that do this. Um, and it's laying an egg in an aphid. That's an amazing picture. Uh, I was really impressed with that one when I found it. We've got a couple of guys at Annan that are doing really good work with some of the photography stuff. It's really cool. But that aphid will turn either black or brown with the larva on the inside of it. And when it's done, it'll hollow that sucker out and pop out. It's pretty cool. I think some of the horn tails though, uh, those were mentioned in here. So Symphyta, that group is plant feeding. Their larva look kind of like uh, caterpillars, but they're a little bit different. They don't have, uh, they don't have pro legs like a caterpillar does. They just have the six true legs on the front. Uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind on uh, on this group. But yeah, thanks for bringing those up. Yeah, horn tails are plant feeders. Okay, 
Does anybody know what's going on here? Uh, what is the bigger insect here? Y'all can type it in the chat box or respond either way. The ladybug larvae. That's one of the mite destroyers. It's a it's a different species that doesn't have the the waxy bits that come off of them. Uh, and then those are two aphid species. So he's just waiting on another snack. Okay, what about this? This is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, there were so many aphids in this field, but there is so much going on here. We've got lacewing eggs there and a whole little cluster, which is very unusual. Uh, ladybug eggs all spread out all over the place. Those are the dark yellow things. And then a bunch of aphids all over for everybody to snack. So the predators weren't following the normal rules about spreading stuff out a little bit because there was just a ridiculous number of aphids. Okay, we're ready to go on to some of the sucking pests. These are real fun. Uh, this is a pretty good picture because it's got the underside of the insect. Uh, you can tell where his beak kind of lies. You can tell it's attached at the front there, but it doesn't articulate until it gets down to the chest. So it still moves around uh, closer to the chest. So he's a plant feeder. He's not going to be a predator. Okay, this is a leaf-footed bug. That was a that was a leaf-footed bug species that we had the underside picture there earlier. Uh, these guys are plant feeders and can be a real pain to get get rid of. Uh, the control methods for these, depending on it depends on your scale, like what your approach is going to be. But removing them in soapy water, soapy water kills everything. Um, insects breathe through spiracles all down the side of their body, uh, so it's it's just little bitty holes all down the side of their body. If you can cover those up with a film of soap then they can't breathe and they'll suffocate. Uh, so that, that's a, soapy water is always a good way to get rid of bugs. Um, applying an insecticide, Espen Valerate's the one that works best on those. There's a couple of trade names for them. I can't think of them off the top of my head. I know the ones that we use in row crop, but I'm not sure about. I know there are some available from like Walmart or a feed store if you have, have them bad in like a bigger scale. But otherwise, these guys are difficult to control because they are highly mobile. Uh, and they can fly in and out. Okay, stink bugs. Here's another one that this is another true bug test. Uh, these guys have the sucking mouth parts again. That's a brown stink bug up on the top there. And uh, their eggs, you can tell these pictures of the eggs are pretty good. They've got their barrel shaped with a little crown around the top. That's a pretty good indicator that it's stink bug eggs. Normally, when they're darker, they're closer to hatching, but it does depend on the species. Uh, you can kind of see the egg, the eyes and stuff on the ones that are paler colored, though. The green one, that's a green stink bug, which is another common species we have down here. There are groups of predatory stink bugs. Normally, if the stink bug is predatory, uh, they've got, there's a couple species. One of them looks like it's got an anchor on its back. Uh, the whole thing is like kind of black and white, and it's got, looks like the shape of an anchor in black, and then there's white patches on the shoulders. Uh, and some of the other ones mostly have very pointy shoulders. I know that sounds kind of strange, but let me see if we can find. So these adults, see how these are a little bit pointy there? That's just a regular brown stink bug, but the predatory ones, they'll have like a legit spine coming off the side. Uh, and those are going to be predatory species, not uh, plant damaging. Um, so those, those are brown stink bugs. Those are common. They're a little bit harder to kill than the green ones, which is on the tomato there, and they're pretty indiscriminate on what they eat. They'll eat pretty much any plant. Uh, there's some more brown stink bug nymphs hatching there. But uh, you'll notice that they lay their eggs in clusters. So with stink bugs, once they've laid their eggs, you'll have damage in uh, kind of in spots and then they'll spread out. Predatory stink bugs are good, yes, but there are a lot of them that are not. So you just have to kind of look and see what species you have. For the most part, it's probably not going to be predatory, though. The majority of them are not. Uh, control methods. Uh, stink bugs can take off on weeds. So if you can control your weeds, you may have less of an issue. Uh, you can remove them from plants again. So if your water works, uh, pyrethroids do work on them, uh, or seven dust. So that's another thing that you can use to control stink bugs. Anybody know what this guy is? No, I did not have a marmorated brown yellow, right? Yeah. 
but they are here. Okay, so this is a spittle bug, but these are going to be a plant feeder as well. Uh, so nymphs make that spit all over the place. You can kind of see them there on the edge of the plant towards the right, that leaf that's going up on the right. Uh, you can see the nymph a little bit there, but they generate a bunch of spit and stuff. So to protect them from predators and other stuff, yeah, they, they do look like frogs. I like them a lot. They're, they're neat, but they're a nuisance of a, of a plant pest. Uh, the adults look like that with the stripes there. Uh, what about these? Does anybody know what, everybody know what these are? Aphids. Yeah. So this is a few different species. I think those are oleander aphids on the right. And then on the left here, we've got sugarcane aphids and yellow sugarcane aphids. Uh, you can see on the oleander aphids, which are the ones on the right, uh, they've got these little sticks coming off the butt there. So those are called cornicles. Uh, aphids take in a lot more sugar than they can process. So they'll, uh, this is why you'll see them with ants. Ants will follow them around and like pick up the excess sugar and they'll kind of guard them and take care of them, almost like tending cows or something. They'll follow a little herd, or, herd of aphids around and the, and the ants will protect them. It's pretty common. Uh, they get into okra real bad. Uh, fire ants will with aphids. Uh, they'll, I mean, aphids will gather up ants wherever they're at. Um, but anyway, if left unchecked, that excess sugar, uh, aside from being a good thing for other bugs to get, it'll coat the outside of the plant. You'll wind up with black mold all over your plant. So that's going to be referred to as either sooty mold or sooty mildew, depending on who you talk to. Uh, and that can cause a plant problems on your plants with uh, photosynthesis as well as being uh, kind of starting to rot and making it easier for disease to get in. Um, Oh, that's another point I didn't make with the sucking insects. Disease transmission is a huge issue. Uh, aphids transmit a number of viruses, different stuff. Uh, if you think about it, even if the virus doesn't necessarily need the, the, there are viruses that need a specific insect to be transmitted. But uh, another thing to think about is these, these guys are not like meticulously clean or anything. And they're just walking around stabbing plants willy nilly, especially if they're not real particular on which kind they, or even if they are particular, but they can transmit disease just by having a physically dirty mouth. So it's like walking around stabbing a dirty needle into your plant. Uh, so that can be an issue as well. Okay, does anybody know what these are? No one? These are real small. And they can make a big mess. Mealy bugs. Those are mealybugs, yeah. So these do the same thing with the sugars. Uh, they make uh, that wax, that stuff, that's the white stuff all over them, that's actually a wax. So a lot of true bugs will do that uh, with the wax to deter predators. So that's all that is, it's a mechanism to deter predators. But they'll do the same thing as aphids as far as causing sugar problems or you know feeding damage and all that, and they can transmit disease as well. Uh, control methods. So insecticidal soaps and oils, uh, or just regular soap, dish soap, soap spraying on this stuff, those work really well on aphids, mealybugs, and uh, what was the other one on there? I think it was just, maybe it was just aphids. It's the smaller soft-bodied stuff that's plant feeding. It works well on those. Um, and then systemic insecticides also work very well, too, since they're feeding a good deal out of the plant. Uh, imidacloprid, uh, those are, and dinosaurine, those are both uh, neonicinoids, so that's something that's going to be in the plant. But you want to make sure and check the label on those and see what your harvest intervals are uh, and whether or not you want to use something like that, because it does depend. But again, the insecticidal soaps or oils work very well on these, uh, just because they're pretty sensitive. But you have to get good coverage. If you don't get it on them, it's not going to work. Okay, chewing pest. This is a Katie did. That's a lovely close up of his mouth. Uh, but yeah, as you can see, chewing mouth parts, they cause chewing damage. So they're not going to be, you're not going to be looking at little holes punched and stuff or little dark spots damage on your plants. You're going to be looking at chunks missing out of the leaves. Uh, this is a, the top one there is a salt marsh caterpillar. The bottom one there is a sphinx moth. Uh, the sphinx moth caterpillar on the bottom right, that one's been infested with a parasitoid wasp uh, 
there. So it's got wasp pupa all over it and that caterpillar isn't gonna make it. Uh, but the adult there looks pretty good. But they will they will decimate some stuff. Like when they get big, those suckers can eat through everything. Um, sphinx moths are, they are kind of particular on what species of plants they'll feed on, but they're one for all kinds of stuff. So it doesn't necessarily rule out that you'll get caterpillars. Uh, depending on what kind of plants you have. Uh, the salt marsh caterpillars there, those guys are a little more indiscriminate. I mostly see them on weeds, so I don't know that I've, I don't know that I've seen them specifically in garden stuff, but that doesn't mean that they won't get into them. I'm sure they will. Uh, this guy is the bane of my existence currently. Um, we have all kinds of issues with this thing. It's got BT resistance in it. Um, this is the cotton bollworm or corn earworm, or tomato fruit worm, or, you know, pretty much whatever. This thing is very, very uh, varied in its diet. It will eat pretty much whatever. Um, normally, they lay their eggs singly. I know here I've got a picture of two of them. BT, so Bacillus thuringiensis, that's a, you can use that as a dust uh, for caterpillar control. Um, BT is specific to caterpillars, um, and that's something that Corn has a, a BT gene. You can buy, buy sweet corn with the BT gene that will keep the caterpillars from eating it, eating it as much. Um, the way BT works is it's a protein in the plant that uh, it came from, it has a bacterial origin uh, and the protein binds to a, well, okay. So caterpillars have a basic gut system rather than acidic like we do. So the protein breaks down into a crystalline structure, and then that crystalline structure, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. That is one strain is for caterpillars. There are other strains of the BT. Um, anyway, breaks down in the gut. The crystalline structure will bind to a receptor in the gut, and it will make the caterpillar's gut leak, basically. So it'll starve to death pretty well uh, and get infections and stuff because their guts are all leaking and all that bacteria goes all over the place. I do love the mosquito dunks. Thanks, Beth. Um, those are wonderful. I threw some of those out yesterday. Works well on mosquitoes. Uh, but yeah, so that's how it works on caterpillars. Um, normally, again, they don't lay eggs next to each other. It's normally just one at a time because this guy is highly uh, cannibalistic. It will eat anything. Again, not discriminate on what it will eat. Normally, if there's two of them there, only one of them will walk away. Um, but if you see this moth, or that caterpillar, it will probably eat whatever you have because they're not picky. Um, they come in a variety of colors, so that's kind of fun. Um, that one's yellow, I've seen them green, orange, brown, pink, uh, whatever. They'll come in whatever color. It's great. They're a dreadful nuisance. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? My dog was beating up the cat. Can you repeat what kind of moth that was? Um, this is a Helia caverpa is the moth name, but it's a Corn earworm, tomato fruit worm, cotton bowl worm. Uh, it's got a bunch of common names because it eats lots of things. Awesome, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the control methods for uh, caterpillars, you can use plant covers, pick them off, soapy water works too. Um, whenever we were checking sweet corn when I was a kid, we used to have uh, we would send the younger siblings off to go dig around the sand pile, gather up a whole bunch of toads and put them in a bucket, and then we throw the caterpillars in the toad bucket. Um, but that's after it's already in your corn, so that doesn't really help. Uh, but BT works on caterpillars or uh, any other labeled product, depending on what your pest is. It does give them a stomach ache. Yeah, but, oh, sorry, I'm reading the comments there. I think everybody can see them, though. But yeah, BT does work. It works better on some species than others. So again, the cotton bollworm or the corn earworm, it doesn't work as well on them anymore. Uh, army worms. So BT works okay on these guys. Uh, they behave differently. They look very similar to the earworm, but they behave very differently. As you can see, the eggs are laid in a cluster there. Uh, these guys will spread out once they feed. So you'll start seeing bad chewing damage in one place in the field or in your, uh, in your garden and it will get worse or get less bad from there. It's like a target, you know, it's real bad in the middle where it's red and then it just kind of spreads out. Uh, but that's because they're laid in a big bunch right there and then they spread out. Uh, they're not real cannibalistic. Um, the best way to tell them apart from 
your earworms or some of the other species is they've got that pretty distinct inverted Y on their face. And then on their butt, they've got four spots on, on the butt. And it'll form like a perfect little square on the back two segments of the caterpillar. And then the moth uh, has a lot of striping, but there's a lot of brown moths. It's kind of hard to tell. Um, but on the caterpillars, that's the part you're going to, the ones you're going to be trying to control. Control methods, again, plant covers, soapy water works, BT works. Um, I think pyrethroids still work okay on them. Uh, they're also an issue in hay patches. Uh, fall armyworms are pretty common right now if y'all got hay. Uh, this guy is cool. Uh, this is the squash vine borer. So these are a giant pain in the butt if you get them. Uh, but the moths look like a wasp. It's, it's really neat looking. Um, and they're very fast. But once you get these, they're very difficult to control. Uh, the best way, cultural control works better on these than chemical control does. Um, if you want to try and kill them chemically, you need to be doing it while they're in the adult stage, um, not while they're in the larval stage. Because once the larva stage is inside of the plant, it makes it a lot harder to kill. Um, I think I've got, yeah, so rotating plants. Uh, you can't just bury them into the ground, though. You got to pull the ones that are infected out and discard those, either burn them or do so, you know, move them elsewhere so they're not in your garden anymore. Um, plant squash types that they don't like as much. Um, there's a list of those right there that they don't necessarily like as much. And I see in here butternut squash. They don't, don't get into butternut squash. Uh, plant covers work on them, but you got to keep them out of it. Uh, you can inject BT. I've heard of people doing that. I think it's a little bit more expensive and I don't know how well it works because I think you have to get it pretty close to where the caterpillar is feeding. And if you don't, then it doesn't work real well. Um, or, you know, again, spraying a labeled product at the first sign of mobs. Um, the, some of the trouble with spraying things like pyrethroids uh, that I've mentioned is that they're broad spectrum. Um, so seven dust is another one. That's an organophosphate. So uh, but putting that stuff out, it's broader spectrum. It's going to kill your good stuff, too. So if you've got predatory bugs out there, it'll kill that as well as killing the ones that are causing you issues. The grasshoppers, another chewing mouth part test. Uh, I think everybody knows what these guys look like. Uh, katydids are similar. The grasshoppers have shorter uh, antenna. The ones on here are the differential grasshoppers. Um, I've seen some of the Obscure, obscure bird grasshoppers have been common lately. Uh, there's those really big green ones with the yellow stripe down their back. Yeah, they do make, these do make great fish bait, um, but they can cause problems in your garden. Um, you can plant stuff they prefer not to eat or bear your netting, uh, and pyrethroids work pretty well on them. Bifenthrin works, and uh, lambda cyhalothrin works, and uh, Rhinoxapira is another one that works. Rhinoxapira is not a broad spectrum, and it works well on them. Yeah, chickens like them too. Chickens are dinosaurs. I hadn't interacted with them a whole lot until my mother-in-law got some, and I, I did not realize how aggressive they are with, with eating bugs. It's kind of amazing. Okay, leaf miners. So these are a species of fly, actually. And one of the best ways to get rid of leaf miners is to prune the plant. So if you get rid of that, uh, it's on, they're in the larval stage whenever they're inside of your plant. So if you prune them, uh, they won't pupate and reproduce. Uh, probably want to burn them or discard those leaves some way so you don't wind up having an issue with, with them in there later. Uh, keeping your plants healthy. Uh, sicker plants do tend to attract uh, insect pests. Uh, plants release a lot of different chemicals into the air that we can't necessarily sense, but uh, insects can. So they'll go to stuff that's not feeling well. And that, that doesn't just go for these guys. That goes for everything. So keeping your nutrient management, your soil management good will help keep your plants healthy as well. Um, covering your soil with plastic, because again, the larval stage in the leaves, and then they'll come out of the leaves and the pupate in the soil. So if you keep them, keep the adults from emerging out of the soil and going into the leaves again. Uh, laying eggs in the leaves again. Horticultural oils work, deem, spinosad, that stuff works on them as well. Uh, snails and slugs, these are rasping tests. They've got kind of like a cat tongue that they'll use to peel stuff off uh, or scratch up your leaves and that's how they eat. Uh, 
reducing moisture, which I know is difficult uh, with as much rain as we can get at times, um, women's places for them to hide. Um, I know one of the worst places, before I moved out here, uh, I had a little flower bed along the edge of my porch, but it was a raised porch. It was shaded underneath and there was a lattice there. Um, so it pretty well stayed covered and kind of wet underneath that porch. And there were snails galore underneath that thing. Um, so if you can limit spots like that, that they can hide, it really does help out. Um, the copper stripping around the edges helps prevent them getting in, but if they're already in there, uh, it doesn't do anything for you. Uh, same with the netting and the screening, you can do that to protect, protect your seedlings. Uh, the hollowed out melon rind or a shallow container, I've heard the beer works pretty good. I haven't heard anything on the apple cider. Uh, and then chunking them in the morning, they'll come to it to eat. And then you throw it out after they're, you know, gone in there and fed. Uh, or a labeled slug or snail bait, I think will work pretty well too. So it's just your preference on getting rid of those. Okay, bark lice. Again, these guys are not actually causing any harm. If you've got them on your trees, they're kind of ugly, but honestly, if you just want to get rid of them, I'd just hose them off uh, and they'll, you know, they'll leave. But they're normally feeding on the lichen, they're on decaying stuff, so they're not doing any damage to trees. I get a call every year about these on trees. Um, and most importantly, whenever you're doing chemical application, always follow the label. Uh, that is a very important thing. Go through and read that. It's an always follow the label. It just, you know, keep up with that, do everything safely. I don't want anybody to either get in trouble legally or um, or physically get in trouble with something. Okay, I'm going to quiz you. I'll see how you're paying attention. Sound good? So it's a pest or is this a good thing? Good. All right. Yeah, it's good. This is a, anybody know what it is? Swing. Good job. Okay, what about number two? What is that one? Number two. Not number three. We're not on number three yet. No, y'all are good. <laughs> okay, number two is a lace wing. It's on a stick there. That egg is laid on a stalk with the lace wing larva. Yeah, they're a lacewing egg, yes. All right, number three, everybody was right on that one. That is a bad thing, that's a leaf-footed bug. And you can kind of see how his mouth parts are attached there too, so that's a pretty good picture. Uh, number four, what about that one? What are those, the big yellow things, not the little ones? Ladybugs, that's right, those are ladybug pupa. What about number five? Grasshopper, yeah, those are bad. Hey, do you guys have any questions? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I have a couple of questions. This is Tara. The first yeah. thing is, so let's say I have an infestation of aphids and then some of the predatory pests come in. Once they've eaten all of the aphids, what happens to the predatory pests? Do they stick around? Do they end up becoming a problem? Uh, it depends on the species. I wouldn't say that they would become a problem, though. Um, once you've switched to eating bugs from eating uh, plants, you pretty well don't go back. Um, so as far as species adaptations go, uh, they, don't, they don't cross over much. They're, they're either a predator or they're not. Um, so they're not going to be a problem on your plants. Um, if they can make it to adulthood, a lot of the adult species, adults of predatory species can fly, so they'll probably just leave and go somewhere else that's got more... Uh, more snacks for them. Okay, and my second question is, what category does a dung beetle fall in? I guess it's dung beetles. When my dog uses the bathroom in the yard, if I don't get out there right away to pick it up, there are these little beetles that are all over it. Well, I think they'd be beneficial. I mean, they're, uh, they're decomposers, so I would think that they're a good thing. Okay, and so what category would those, I mean, like, is it, is it a hard shell with a, what, uh, it's a beetle. So a beetle is going to be a, a beetle. Beetles are in their own group. That's Coleoptera. So those are the ones with the shell. Yes, ma'am. Okay, right on. Thank you. Yeah, yeah those no are problem. probably <laughs> ground beetles. I'll be covering those. Uh, not, not all ground beetles. Most, the family with ground beetles in it is actually predatory. Uh, dung beetles are normally in the scarab group. 
We do have two species of dung beetles in our area, but they're more out in the ranches. I, I would surprise to find them in mm -hmm. the city. But anyway, possible. That's cool. Have you seen the rainbow ones? Those are my favorite. They're really cool. Uh, those rainbow scarabs, they're, they're beautiful. Negative. I've, I've, they're... I've heard of a rhinoceros type E and a brown one that's very plain, and that's it. It might be the, it's got a big horn on the end of its nose, or the males do anyway. They've got two groups. They've got uh, one that's got a really big horn on the nose and one that's got a shorter one. Uh, and they're in the same species. Uh, and then the females don't have one, but they're like green metallic and with like red and blue on their backs too. But the front end of them's green. They're really cool looking. But you should definitely well, then I'm glad our, our plastic demo bug is green and has a horn on it. So that's good. We're, we're, we're that's accurate. Right. <laughs> Okay, I will not have that for Thursday. That's <laughs> in the office in Robstown. <laughs> Any awesome. other questions for Kate? Kate, what's the life cycle on the white flies? White flies? Uh, yeah. So those are pretty, those are kind of similar to aphids. Uh, they've yeah. got a similar uh, life cycle to those. Um, they don't pupate, uh, even though they're called a fly, they're not a true fly. They're a, they're a plant bug. They've got the sucking uh, mouth parts and they, it's an egg and then a nymphal stage that doesn't fly and then they uh, molt into the adult stage that does fly. And they're not strong flyers, but they could definitely cause a lot of problems. There are a lot uh, of the problems. Is gonna... Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. They're, they're real bad around here in our gardens and our plant areas when the cotton's in the field. And as soon as the cotton's out of the field, they seem to disappear pretty quick. Really? Yes. Yeah. That's interesting. I, you know, the, the cotton field that I find them real bad in is next to a, a big uh, plant nursery with a vegetable farm on one side of it. I um, wonder if going back and forth does something for them. Uh, they tend to get really bad towards the end of the season. I wonder if they just start to build up late in the season. It, that may be part of it. Um, one we of the actually, cultural practices. Go ahead. Uh, one of the cultural practices we actually recommend is uh, planting stuff that finishes out earlier, as far as row crop goes, anyway. Uh, because the longer the season draws out, the more likely you are to get pest pressure. Um, but you know, when things start to kind of dry up in the fall a little bit, uh, a lot of different species will move into whatever uh, it's still green and if that's your garden then that may be why one, one of the things that happens though is we get a spike right as they defoliate they hit the hit the herbicides on the cotton crops and mm -hmm. depending on the wind direction if the white flies blow in our direction they then find new hosts in our horticultural areas yeah i would um, believe that yeah they move out of whatever drying down and into whatever is still green that's yeah that, that's pretty pretty normal so um sometimes it's not only does it build up in the crop fields but when they don't have any more crop field to feed on they come to us yep um they're a bit harder to control though than the aphids because you can't just spray them with a hose and break their little siphons you know mm -hmm. they fly away and even with going the next step up to like a spinosad or uh you know a safer soap kind of a thing you know y it's windy here every day yeah, <laughs> and they're, they're, they're going to fly away <laughs> Yeah, so coverage can be a problem on those. Um, one of the neonicotinoids do still work on those. So if you can use a systemic on them, uh, that would for sure work. But I know, like with getting into the fall, uh, depending on what you what you have out there, you can run into pre-harvest interval kind of problems. Yeah, you're controlling on those. On, on, on edibles. You don't want to use the yeah. system. Uh, yeah, they're attracted to yellow though. So last year I took yellow solo cups and coated them with uh, Vaseline and put them on sticks in my garden and it worked, get, it, it attracts some of the yellow. And you didn't have oh, a yeah, lot of bycatch? You. Like it, sticky traps, I'm no, afraid of catching beneficials. I didn't. I just, I, well, they were in my greenhouse, but 
See, and this uh, year I don't I don't have white flies this year because the cotton's not across from my house. But last year they they rotate the crops, so last year there was cotton, and as soon as they uh, the cotton got ready to be picked and they had leaf drop, then uh, the white flies came to my greenhouse. But I put yellow solo cups there with the Vaseline and it attracted them. Yeah, that, they, do, they are attracted to yellow. So I, I do know that. Uh, you can put soapy water in it too for them to drown. That'll help too. Um, and Vaseline also works. So that's okay. Cool. That works on psyllids as well. I don't know if y'all have problems with those. They look kind of like really tiny. Uh, they're like the size of an aphid, but they look like cicada. Uh, but they transmit a lot of disease. Uh, but that's, that's something that works on them too. But so in a okay. smaller garden setting anyway. Can I ask you, this is Margaret. I just, yeah. noticed this morning my okra plants have a lot of ants, little tiny ants on them. So I just went out and looked with some magnifying glasses because I, with my naked eye, I couldn't see anything. But yeah, there are a lot of little bitty white, I guess, are those aphids then that the ants are eating off my okra? Uh, it depends. Um, you might, you might look a little closer to see if it is aphids, um, but ants, there's a couple of ant species that have mobile colonies. Uh, so if they've got little white things and they're carrying them around, they may be moving their larva. They don't have, the, the ants didn't ha seem to have anything, but they seem to be, you know, staying and I didn't see them transporting anything. Oh, okay, okay. If they weren't carrying them, it might have been aphids or something. But uh, anything that produces a lot of sugar, they'll come and check those out. Um, so should I put the soapy water on them then? Uh, you can, yeah, you can try it for sure. I, oh, I might have to kind of see it a little bit. That, that, it's hard to get a description on a bug sometimes. I'll try to take a picture, but yeah, I'll spray down the area. Okay, thank yeah. you. Oh, y'all are talking about lady beetle releasing here? Um, well, yeah. You might I'm, look where you get them from, too, if you're releasing lady beetles. Um, depending on where you buy them from. Some people don't gather them correctly. Uh, if you get your lady beetles while they've been hibernating, then they're gonna want to, they're gonna want to scatter as soon as you let them out. Um, if they weren't currently hibernating, then they're more likely to stick around, but it, there's not like a good way to tell when they did it. Kind of play around with the company. Okay, is that lady beetles or lady bugs? Cause we're, tr I'm trying to figure out how to get lady bugs in my yard. So, and I don't know how to do that. Uh, I mean, you can buy them from places. Uh, I don't know if there's a specific way to encourage them to hang around, though. Hey, okay. Do you yeah. know of any plants that they prefer, that they like, or is it is it based upon the fact that they're predatory? They're predatory, so if you've got something for them to eat, they'll pop up. But it, you know, if you don't have a whole lot of aphids or something, which is not something that you want, then you may not see a whole bunch of them. Uh, they will come to light at night, but I mean, everything does. So I don't necessarily recommend leaving a light on. They'll they need a, with a bunch of mosquitoes this time of year. They need a, they need a, 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 a prey item and they also need pollen. Yeah. And, and they need a water source. And they um, are often prey specific. Um, there's a, a ladybug that prefers the aphid that goes to oleander. There's a ladybug that prefers a grass aphid. There's a ladybug that prefers um, the aphids that, uh, oh, it's not coming to mind right now. But in Texas, there are specific ladybugs. But now, the Asian multicolored ladybug, one of the reasons we introduced it was that it's more of a generalist. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Kate, I was just on the Texas Ladybug site earlier. No, you're I, good, you're good. And I found out that the Mexican bean beetle really is a ladybug. Ah! Yeah, so technically it is a ladybug, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, it falls so, into that family. That explains the resemblance. Yep. So, yeah. Spoiler for Thursday. Eh, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> you got a beetle special on Thursday? Uh, well, it's a, a lab that's ap applied to what they're going to encounter here more. Uh, cool. And yes, I, well, 
I, I'm, I'm, I didn't start it out the bug, bug lady. What happened was I'm, I'm like the big picture gal when it comes to ecology. That's, I, I, I'm an earth environmental science major from college and I've just been a nature nut my whole life. And I've been a garden nut my whole life. And I met Doug Tallamy. Are you familiar with his work? I don't know if I am. The name sounds familiar. Okay, he's an entomologist at uh, University of Delaware. Okay. And he, he uh, do you, are you familiar with um, Silent Spring, that book from the 60s? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He wrote the next Silent Spring. It's okay. called Bringing Nature Home. <laughs> and it's basically how we stop extin extinction because the foundation of everything is as you know 80 percent of insects are specialists 80 percent of everything in the world are specialists and if we don't have the native plants that those insects feed on then it doesn't go up the next level of the taxonomy taxon tax 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 <laughs> easy for me to say taxonomic ladder and we have the whole food web collapse from there mm -hmm. so insects are the most important thing because most of our plants as you know are toxic but somehow insects have have evolved either by hosting the right microbes in their guts or whatever to digest mm -hmm. these toxic plants and they can they can take that energy from the sun from plants and transfer it into the food web in these nice nice compact little bundles of protein <laughs> mm -hmm. and they reproduce like crazy <laughs> mm -hmm. you know so if there is abundant food available they become abundant food for the rest of the of, of, of the wildlife and the rest of the world yeah plus they do the they side do. benefit of pollinating our food for us you know? <laughs> yeah <laughs> and pest control yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah, so, it's always good to have a good variety of stuff. Um, I read a study here the other day on um, where our biodiversity is really lacking, and it kind of surprised me. They were talking about how in urban areas, there's a, there's a, there's more diversity in urban areas and rural areas than there are in suburban, and that really surprised me. Um, so I thought that was kind of cool. So yeah, you're right. Definitely encouraging, you know, native plants. That's very important. Well, yeah, because the 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 invasive plants and and non-native uh, uh, ornamentals are going to be planted e either way. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's it's where is the where do we make up the difference? Um, so I don't want to soapbox or proselytize or anything like that. It's just that. That's how I became interested in bugs so heavily um, and why, although I love all living things, I'm going to, if I get an opportunity to go back to graduate school, I'm going to devote myself to entomology because it really is an underserved science and um, we we need to focus on it in order to say, we, we don't even know how many of them are on the decline because we don't even know how many there are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, we know what yeah, species, I know. <laughs> we know what species there are, but we don't know how many individuals of each species there are because we just say they're, 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 they're countless. There's too many of them. Yeah. Well, well some, sampling some, is also a challenge. Some so. infinities are greater than others. <laughs> Anyhow, so yeah, you ought to look up BioBlitz. Have you checked out those? Uh, I don't know about that, but I've been participating in the uh, over the summer bug guide, whatever that is, through A and M. Uh, was it with Irfan, the pollinator thing? No, it was just you know backyard bugs. Have, identify as many as you can, kind of thing. Oh, okay, and okay, that may be Irfan too. They had a list of, you know, targeted pests, and I keep sending them in waggy stuff that's not on the list, and they're like, okay, tell us that, too. <laughs> yeah. It's always good to know. It's, it's good to know, yeah. Because normally, I don't get a call unless it's a problem. Uh, for the most part, people don't call me unless it's an issue. 
um, I had a lot of people looking, sending me pictures of cicada killers uh, this year uh, because there was a lot of attention, media attention on the uh, murder hornet, so that Asian, giant Asian hornet. Uh, um, okay. And our cicada killers look similar, so people started actually noticing them and sending me pictures and wanting to know, hey, are these murder hornets? No, we've had those. They're cicada killers, and I really like them. They're a neat bug. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that one. I, I, I know of cuckoo bees. Are they similar to that? or? No, they're huge. They're like, it's like a two and a half inch wasp. Oh, okay. So it's more similar to like a tarantula hawk kind of thing. Yes. Okay. Actually, it might be bigger than a tarantula hawk. They're, they're a big black and yellow thing, and they carry off cicadas and bury them. They're really neat. <laughs> Uh, just but, when you thought yeah, it was safe to go that. outside the <laughs> well i mean they're not aggressive and they're solitary so they're not guarding a nest like a like another wasp would be you know a, a social wasp um so it's just them on their own so they've got their own little burrow uh but they do like sandier soil so they'll hang out kind of in a group and it'll look like they're social but they're really not terribly something to check up on youtube I'm I'm a transplant mm -hmm. from Pennsylvania, and I'm still learning stuff about Texas. <laughs> yes, we have big bugs. <laughs> I, I got a, I got someone laughing at me my first year here training when I talked about the emerald ash borer. I did not know at the time that Texas had over 300 longhorn beetles, and another one was not a big deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've we've I've seen the stuff on the emerald ash borer, and we've been on the lookout for it, but yeah. Yeah, who cares? The other ones are going to outcompete it. You know? <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah. Other questions from the class. Sorry. Thank you. Kate, do you have anything else to present? I don't think so. I, I can put my contact information up, I guess, if you'll need it. Uh, you guys can send me pictures of stuff. Uh, I think Vince has my uh, my address for the office if you want to mail me bugs. Um, if you mail me bugs, I do ask that uh, you put them in alcohol or in a plastic bag or something and a mailer. Uh, please don't send me stuff on tape. I prefer it to not be on, you know, just stuck to tape. A lot of times it'll get damaged that way and it makes it harder to ID stuff or just like dust them into an envelope. Please don't do that to me. It makes them, they get crushed and I don't generally know what they are. Um, but yeah, alcohol is great. So put them in a small vial. Uh, the mail system has a limit on how much you can do. I think if it's like under an ounce or two, you can still mail it. Uh, but yeah, so little small plastic bottles, send them to me that way. Or pictures, you can email me pictures. I do that all the time. Actually, I will be emailing you a specimen, but they're itty, 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 be tiny, 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 tiny. Um, I, I think uh, an invasive has made it into Texas and um, they're somehow, they're supposed to be a bark beetle, but they somehow I've decided to take up residence in my um, Easter cactus. <laughs> Huh. Yeah, the the larvae burrow in and make this nice little black bullseye, and they're a fungus vector. And um, you said they're a beetle. I think so, if I remember correctly. Okay. Yeah, send them to me for sure. I can look at them. I got a scope in the office, and yeah, I they can, definitely need a scope. Um, but yeah. Uh, 75 to 85 percent alcohol. Don't don't send it to to me much lower than that. Make They're sure dried. Start to degrade. Okay. Everybody unmute and turn on your video so you can wave and thank Kate. Turn on your video and unmute so you can show your appreciation. Thank you, Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was really thank you, good. Thank you. Bye. No thank problem. You. Thank you, Ms. Grumley. Appreciate it. Okay. We'll see you all later. Thank you. Very informative. Very Thank informative. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vince. Thanks, Kay. And I'll be in touch. Thank you. Okay. Bye, Vince. Okay, Bye, Vince. Guys. We'll see you on Thursday at same time, same place. No, okay. not the same place. Hey, Vince. Okay. Lance, hey, Lance. Vince. Okay. Somebody that got. Anybody that got roses needs to quarantine them probably from the botanical garden. They need to practice IPM. So I wouldn't put them next to all your other plants for a little while. Okay.
Cool. All right, we'll see you guys on Thursday. Been and the okay. uh, login will be for the lab, okay? Not for the class, it'll be for the lab. I'll send it out uh, ahead of time so that if you don't have it, you can go to the BMS and click on the link there. I worked on that this weekend, uh, fixing those links, so it should all work. So we'll see you guys on Thursday. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.